as we just have sung, um, we want to see greater things done in our city, in the greater Spokane area. Our speaker this morning has probably seen a, a lot happen in the evangelical church in the time that he has been ministering in this area. Uh, Jerry Larson he just turned 80 this past year, so this year he'll be 81, and a man of uh, great energy, and uh, uh, he's going strong. He is was the uh, founding pastor of Valley Bible Church back in the 1980s, and um, has been going strong ever since. And um, he is a man uh, who embodies evangelism. A lot of us talk about sharing our faith, and a lot of us know a lot of theology and a lot of scripture when it comes to evangelism and how people come to know Christ. And this is a man who actually does that on a daily basis. And so um, strap into your chairs because I think you will need to be. Jerry, would you come and share with us this morning? Uh, and I want to mention once again, well, he'll mention it, but this evening at 6.30, he will continue what he's talking about. Thank you, brother. Good morning. Well, I tell you, I don't know where all these years go. In August, I turned 80, and I'm just happy to be above ground. And I just, uh, it's amazing how you look at life a little bit different. I skydived on my birthday. When I left that plane at 13,000 feet, I said, oh, Jesus, pay attention. And uh, anyway, my life has never been the same. So it's, uh, it's been an interesting thing. I've never, I don't know when I felt the sense of urgency more than I have this last year. And to realize, and I hope all of us will catch this this morning, that all of us, when we look at our world, I mean, every day when we read the paper, we think, dear God, what's going to happen next? Who's going to shoot who? Who's going to blow up what? Who's going to whatever? And I just pray that we will realize, maybe like we never have before, that we've got to look at life and that we've got to buy up every opportunity to make a difference for Jesus Christ. I told people in the first service, and it's just so thrilling for me to be here today, uh, and it's just, I'm just kind of overwhelmed with all of it, just driving here from North Spokane. Uh, we live up off Francis and Indian Trail, which is awesome, because I had a, almost an hour to pray before I got here, and just to meditate on the whole day and our time together tonight. And I'm praying that God will use me to help make a difference in your life. You're not here this morning by accident. Amen? You're here by divine appointment. And God has something to say to you this morning. Amen? That's so weak. Now listen up, okay? And we need to come with the attitude that every time we hear the word of God, I've got to internalize it, and then I've got to flesh it out, okay? And sometimes we just come, and that's not our attitude, you know, and that's sad. All right, now, uh, would you allow me to make one commercial before we begin? Anybody beside me hate commercials? Anybody beside me mute commercials? <laughs> yeah, we're okay. We've got our own support group. Okay, please don't mute this one. I brought with me this morning a book, A Life That Matters. My prayer, <laughs> if, I ever, if I've ever read a book, and I've read hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books, in the last 60 years. Many times I've read at least a book a week. If I've ever read a book that I pray that every Christian will read this book, it's this one, A Life That Matters. Let me read the, some of the chapter titles. Out of the Holding Pattern, Your Personal Titanic. Your clever disguise, getting into the lives of people that need you, 
breaking the silence. Would you like to supersize that? Thinking lost. That's the first six ver chapters of this book. Now here's the sad news. I sold out all of these in the first service. This is the only one I've got left. But on the table, there's a, uh, a sheet. If you want one, sign it up, sign up. I'll order some tomorrow, and then I'll get them to your pastor, and you can pick up your copy, okay? I used to tell people, if this book doesn't light your fire, your wood's wet, okay? <laughs> Something else I used to tell people, if you buy this book for $10 and it doesn't change your life and it doesn't light your fire, I'll give you your money back. But I don't do that anymore. Now I say the church will give you your money back, okay? So sign up for this. It's just awesome. But one of the things else that you'll find on the back table are little booklets called May I Ask You a Question? This is a little booklet about the good news, the bad news. The bad news is about us. The good news is about what Jesus did. The bad news is so bad, that's what makes the good news so good, right? Okay? And what all of us need is how to present it in a simple way. This is, and I've gone through hundreds of stuff. This is still my favorite. Take some of these. They're on the back table when you leave. If you want to throw in a dollar or two so I can buy more of them to give away, be my guest. If you don't, just take some and let God start to use you this year, okay? I want this to be the greatest year in our life. I mean, I'm at an age now where I'm sniffing glory, folks, you know? So I'm probably looking at life a little bit different than some of you are. But I'll tell you one thing, I just have come through the, one of the greatest years of my life, and I know this will surprise you, even at 80, the last six months I've been speaking at youth groups, beside teaching in different churches all over, and I've seen more teenagers come to Christ in the last six months than I have in the last few years. It's just been incredible. So if you know of a church that's looking for an 80-year-old youth pastor, would you give him my name? So that's the way I want to spend the rest of my life. I also have one of my favorite quotes that you have in your bulletin this morning. Promise me you'll take this home. You'll put it on the mirror, your bathroom mirror when you shave every morning, or you'll put it by the kitchen sink or whatever. And let God use this in your life. Now, promise me you'll do that. All right? Tell me you got that. Boy, I tell you, you guys, we're, we've got a long way to go this morning. <laughs> I tell you, it's uh, <laughs> I read something about a couple of weeks ago. I read a book that just has also lit my fire. But one comment in this book was, most people have just enough Jesus to be bored, but not enough Jesus to let the, uh, an adrenaline rush come through them to where they're making a dynamic difference where God's placed you. No one can reach your world except you. And that's why we're here, and that's why I'm here. In fact, I'm here because of tonight at 6.30. Here's what I want to do tonight. How do you get involved in people's lives? How do you build relationships? How do you get into spiritual conversations? How do you sow seed while we're nudging people closer to Christ? Does anybody here need help with that? Does that mean you're going to be here tonight? If you don't come back at 6.30, I hope you have a miserable evening. <laughs> I didn't mean that, but in some ways I did. So <laughs> forgive me, Lord. Okay. Well, I'm just so, in other words, I'm here to make an investment in your life. I'm here to help you set the pace 
for your new year. You know, we're not here to vegetate our way to glory, are we? That's why I love to talk to old people, because I tell them what the pastor would like to tell them. You know, don't go to, don't go to Florida in your RV. For God's sake, take a box of Bibles if you go. You know, so many times I think, what in the world are we doing? You know, a great question to ask yourself every day. What on earth am I doing for heaven's sake? Right? Isn't that a good question to ask yourself? Talk to me. Yes, Jerry. Thank you. All right. Now, what I want to do this morning, I want to, to whet your appetite for 630 tonight. I want to take you to three passages of Scripture. I never do this. Usually I take one passage and dig in. But this is a little different day. So I'm going to take three passages of Scripture and give you a little bit of highlights from three passages of Scripture and hope it'll set the tone for your new year. All right, passage number one. Turn to it, please. Matthew chapter 9. If I was to, if somebody was to ask me what passage of Scripture, there's many, and I'm giving you some of them this morning. But if I was to pick out one passage that God has used in a powerful way in my life, the last 18, in fact, I'm starting my 19th year of traveling around the western part of the United States. I go down to Arizona and do some ministry in February. Notice I go to Arizona in February, not August, okay? That's where God leads me, all right? Then I've been up in Canada, and I went three or four years, had some ministry in Hawaii. That's a good place to suffer for Jesus, and, uh, and they need it. I've had some incredible... You know what? I, I'm in hog heaven in Hawaii. You know why? I'm sharing Christ with people every day from all over the world, and then they can take the message and take it home with them. I was on a boat ride and had a powerful time to share my testimony in the gospel with a couple from Germany. Now, son, go home and tell everybody what I've just told you. Okay? Now, look, come on. We got a, well, I'm an Egyptian mummy pressed for time, so we're going to have to just hit some highlights on this. All right, Matthew 9. Listen up. And you'll see why I love this. Jesus went throughout all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. Now, listen up. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Class, are we living in a world where people are harassed? They're helpless. They're hopeless. They don't know what way to turn, right? Okay. And when Jesus saw the crowds, he was filled, I love the phrase, filled with compassion. Why? Because he saw people as sheep without a shepherd. That's how he saw them. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, Okay, but the workers are few. Isn't that the truth? Ask, pray, continuous action, command verb, pray that the Lord of the harvest would thrust out, send out workers into the harvest field. All right, that's our passage. Now look up. Now here's what I want you to get out of that. And we need to understand this. We have, yes, are we living in the darkness? We are. Can our light shine like it's never been shining before? Amen. That's why we're here. That's why he hasn't called you home so you can be a light where he's planted you. Okay? And so therefore, God says the harvest is plentiful. Now what he needs to do is take us and get us out there. I've spent the last 18 years of my life trying to help Christians get out of the holy huddle. We love the holy huddle, don't we? 
You won't admit it, but I'm telling you that you do. Oh, 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 I just love to get together, you know, my Christian friends and my Christian Bible studies and my Christian radio programs and my, oh, good night. We're gagging on truth that we haven't even lived out yet. Okay? Man, so many of us were, good night. Man, most of us are constipated. We just keep taking in truth and we never give any of it out. Don't look at me like that. And I'm just saying what's on my heart and I say what I want to say and I'm going to get out of here. Okay, now you just love your pastor. He's the one that invited me, so. <laughs> now don't blame him for what I'm He didn't know what I was going to say, okay? So don't blame him, all right? All right. So anyway, I love this passage. And here, okay, you know the verb that Jesus said to send out workers? The verb has the idea of thrusting out. You know what would be awesome? That if the pastor and the elders stood at the back door, where, I mean, where you came in today on the side door, whatever door, at every door there was somebody. And as you leave this morning, somebody would grab you like this and say, now get out there. Now here, now get out there. Wouldn't that be awesome? Slap you around a little bit? All right. Now, get this, and if you, if you get this, I'm going to die happy, all right? Now, listen up. Here's why God used this passage in such a powerful way in my life. When Jesus was filled with compassion, he saw people. He saw them as sheep without a shepherd. Stop right there. Question. How do you see people? Okay, how do I see them? And here's what changed my life forever. 14 years ago, we moved back to Spokane from Oregon. And one of the last years I had, we lived in Oregon, I met a brilliant eye surgeon who lives in, and he asked me if I would teach a Bible study in his home which I was happy to do. It was fun just to go to his house, if you know what I mean. His brilliant eye surgeon, you know, and like my little adobe didn't look too good next to where I was having these Bible studies. Godly man. His office was near downtown Portland, near the Oregon Eye Bank. How many of you know there's an eye bank in Portland, Oregon? Do you really? It's amazing. Okay, great. I was there for over 20 years and didn't know there was an eye bank in Portland. Can you imagine going into an eye bank? Just get a couple of new ones and head out? Okay. But anyway, this friend of mine, I found out, he had the testimony of being the number one eye transplant surgeon on the West Coast, Washington, Oregon, and down through Northern California. Anyway, and he was brilliant at cornea transplants. And then one day it hit me like a ton of bricks. Here was a man that I was studying in his home with him. And he was a gifted at eye transplants. And you know what hit me like nothing has ever hit me before? Jesus, I need a divine eye transplant so I can start to see people like you do as sheep without a shepherd. And it's changed my life. Before we move back here, I was coming home from golfing and I drove by a big high school. When was the last time you drove by a big high school? Saw some of those strange creatures? No, you know what I mean. Anyway, you see some of the hair, some of the clothes, and you think, why they buy clothes with holes in them? I mean, have times changed, folks? You know? Okay, beside that, but I love high school kids. I could spend the rest of my life with high school and college kids. But anyway, I'm standing there, sitting there in my car, 
at a long red light. There's about 20 high school kids standing across the street from me. And then one kid walked away from the group. And as he walked away, I noticed he had a ring through his nose. It hung all the way underneath, big. It hung all the way underneath his chin, through his nose, under his chin. And he's walking along like this, eating potato chips. And I looked at that kid, and you know what I thought? I can't tell you everything I thought, but... <laughs> I looked at that kid, and it hit me. Just another sheep without a shepherd. And I wonder if anybody will ever tell that kid that somebody went, loved him enough to go to the cross for him. And it's changed my life. I got a free membership at the YMCA out north. You know, because of my old age, I got a free membership at the Y. So I go down every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, do my little noon, you know, da-da-da. You know, at 80, you got to keep at it, right? Amen? <laughs> Pretty weak. All right. Man, I'm in hog heaven down at the YMCA. I have met, I've been praying with believers that I've met down there. I've been sharing Christ with people down there for about six months now. Man, I, it's just like, man... God, you've opened up a whole new ministry for me down at the YMCA beside all the other stuff that I'm doing. Isn't it awesome to know that God wants to use us? Okay? I don't know if all of you believe this, but I wish and pray to God someday you might believe this. The greatest joy in the Christian life is not another Bible study. Now, you, I know you've never heard a pastor say that, but I say a lot of things you haven't heard before. The greatest joy in the Christian life is knowing that God is using me to help make an eternal difference in people's lives. Amen? Amen. And every time I walk into my bank, you know how the girls in the bank, you know, Every time I walk into my bank and I come to that second little lady, little gal that's in her 30s, she lights up like a Christmas tree. And I think of the joy that I had. And she got off work. We went over to McDonald's and I sat there and led her to faith in Christ. And her life has been changed. And she gets, everybody in the bank knows who I am. I'm the chaplain of my bank, okay? And it's just awesome. I'm not at that bank by accident, right? Okay. We'll, we're going to talk more about this tonight and how you can kind of, I'll put some flesh and blood on some of this. Okay. And just to realize again, I hope we can get this. All of us, God give us a divine eye transplant and to see people in my world as sheep without a shepherd, and you will never be the same. Will you pray that prayer this morning? Will you pray and ask for a divine eye transplant and watch God work in your life? All right, and if you get that, I'm going to die happy. Now tell me, did you get that? Yes. Once more, did you get that? Yes. All right. Now you're ready for my second point. All right, now, now we're really speeding up. <laughs> All right, go to Luke's, Luke's Gospel for a minute. Luke's Gospel, chapter 13. Here's a passage of Scripture. I love the Gospels, by the way. I've probably read something in the Gospels every day for the last 18 years. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I have saturated my mind with the Gospels. But I haven't done anything with this passage for over 40 years, and I don't know why it came to my mind. Now I'll read it, and you'll know why it came to my mind, okay? Now, I'm not going to interpret this passage, but I want to apply it. All right, now, if you got there, tell me you're there. Luke 13. Jesus told two stories, and then he gave a parable to help them understand the two stories. 
okay? There were some Galileans, and their blood was spilled by Pilate, um, whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. In other words, here's some, okay, listen to me now. There were some Jewish people, and they were offering their sacrifices. And Pilate had some guys come in and sabotage the place and start murdering some of them, the Jewish people, why they were offering their sacrifices. Okay, almost sounds like our day, doesn't it? In the Muslim world, it happens every day. All right. Now, the reason why Jesus is saying this, because in the Old Testament, as well as in the Gospels, Jewish people thought that if a tragedy happened, it was because you were a worse sinner than they are. So they categorized people. Every time there was a tragedy, they would say to themselves, they deserved it, those dirty sinners. And Jesus said, I'm going to straighten out your thinking. And then he gave another story. He said, in the middle of this pattern, beginning at verse 3, I mean, verse 4. Remember when the Tower of Siloam fell on 18 people and killed them? You remember that? Do you think those 18 people were more guilty than everybody else? Jesus said, no. I tell you that unless you repent, you also will perish. Now, here, what, now what's he saying? He's saying this. Are there a lot of tragedies in our world, even Christian people that experience tragedies? Answer me, yes. I mean, I read where a mudslide buried a whole missionary family in Papua New Guinea. Okay? Tragedies every single day, aren't there? Okay. So here's the point that they needed to come, and then he gave them a parable. He said, I want you to know that anybody that doesn't put their faith in Jesus Christ, there's judgment ahead. And the more you understand that, the more motivated you are to want to touch the people in your world. We had five friends die last month. Last month. I'm afraid to answer the phone anymore. In fact, I looked at the obituary page this morning. Here's a picture of my friend. I've known him for over 60 years. My picture wasn't there, so I got dressed and came over here. Okay, I just check that out every day. <laughs> What's the point? Get it straight. Everybody needs a Savior, okay? And without him, there's judgment, all right? And sometimes the most loving thing I can do is tell somebody about the future. Now, here's the last point on this passage. And, I, and you can see why I, I picked this passage, I'm sure, when I read this. Now, here's what Jesus said. In case you didn't get this. A man had a fig tree. Listen up now, I'm reading. A man had a fig tree. He planted it in his vineyard. And he went to look for fruit on it. But he did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now, I have, come co I have been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree, and I haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should, it be, why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man said, and replied, just leave it alone for one more year. I'll dig around it. I'll fertilize it. And then if it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, cut her down. Okay, now look up. Did you get that? All right. Boy, I think of how many times God must get discouraged coming and saying, because you're asking for, well, give me one more year, Lord. Yeah, all right. And by his mercy and grace, he might give us all another year. 
All right, now the last passage. I love this. Go to Philippians chapter 1, please. Philippians chapter 1. It's probably my favorite book in the New Testament. I love the book of Philippians. In chapter 1, we're going to end with this. And all of what I'm saying now is getting you ready for 6.30 tonight. And I've got some handouts for you tonight that are awesome and some material that's going to help you make a difference. All right? So, did, Ben, I forgot. Did I tell him about the go mad? Did I forget that? Huh? Did I forget it? For this service? Okay, I'll throw it in now. <laughs> I'll throw it in now, okay? Uh, I won't even charge you for this thought, okay? But I love this. A guy that wrote the book that I showed you this morning, A Life That Matters, I'll never forget one time when I heard him. Every day when his kids went to school, he would stand in the door and shout, Go mad! Every day, Monday to Friday, go mad! One day the neighbor came over and said, I'm really upset. He said, I hear you yelling at your kids every day, go mad! He said, well, my kids understand what I'm saying. M-A-D, make a difference. So when they get will leave school, they head out, yell at your kids, go mad. Your husband leaves for work, hopefully he's not mad already, but you know what I mean. <laughs> hopefully he's not mad already, okay? All right. Every one of us, your wife leaves the door, house, you leave the house, whatever. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we kept challenging each other? Go mad today and make a difference in your world. All right, now Philippians 1. Okay, I'm just, I'm just, oh, I've got, okay, I'm just going to read this and give you my outline. Okay. I don't, the pastor invites me back. We'll finish this someday. All right? It's got to be soon for me, though. All right. Down to verse 12. <coughs> Follow me quickly on this, and, we, and we'll have it all. We'll get ready for our uh, training time tonight. Paul said, now, I, we're Philippians 1, I'm plugging in at verse 12. Now, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Stop right there. Are you getting this? Paul's passionate desire was the advancement of the gospel. Tell me you got that. That's what drove him, was the advancement of the gospel. I tell you, I was, I was so challenged. Uh, the new football coach at Whitworth, he moved out here from Chicago. He's the, one of the most dynamic Christian men I've ever met. He's just an incredible man. And he's here to make a difference for Jesus Christ on those football players at Whitworth. I'm praying the rest of the faculty will catch it, but uh, don't put that in your notes, please. Uh, all right. Now, he invited me to a meeting out at Whitworth. And three men came out from Chicago that were from Wheaton, <coughs> Wheaton College. And these three men are traveling all over the United States, visiting every Christian college and helping them to learn how to make an impact on all of their students so that when those students graduate, no matter what business or what calling they have in their life after they leave college, they'll plant a Christian flag and stand up for Jesus Christ wherever they go. And they're trying to help them with this. And do you know what all the Christian colleges have told these three men so far? I think they have visited anywhere from 12 to 18 colleges as they travel all over the United States. All of the presidents of these colleges so far, Christian colleges, have told them that evangelism 
is way down on the totem pole of what we're committed to. It's hardly even on the radar screen. On screen. And you know what you want to say? For God's sake, why do you exist? The church is the only institution in the world that exists for the people that aren't yet in it. So you got Christian colleges, and they're not committed. You got other Christian stuff, so they're not committed. And then you got Christians all over the world, not the world, they're the ones that are on fire. They're sending missionaries here. I pray that everybody that comes in contact with you this year will get a sense that here's somebody that knows the direction that they're moving and you can hardly wait to introduce them to your best friend. One of the things that meant so much to me when my middle son went to Central Valley High School, once a week I'd go over to the high school and just meet kids. Can't do that much anymore. But I used to go over there once a week and just meet kids. And since my son is one of the stars athletes over there, anyway, I'd stand in the hallways and my son would stand there with his arm around me and introduce me to his friends. And you know what was no meaningful to me? He loved to introduce me to his friends. Question for all of you. Who's your best friend? Is his name Jesus? Do you love to introduce him to somebody? Question, do you? Or is it just going to be another one more year, Lord? No, that's not going to do it. All right, here, I just almost lost my place here. All right, well, here it is. Now pick up in here and we're ready to close in prayer. Now, Paul said, I'm in chains, and most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. In other words, Paul said, I'm in jail. All right? Now, some people think, well, that's kind of discouraging. Paul's in jail. No, he's, they weren't discouraged. Paul said, I'm in jail. And they all the Christian guards that come in contact with me, I'm making a difference in their lives. So while I'm sharing Christ with the prison guards, they were more courageous and fearless to share Christ out where they were. Okay? Then, and that's why... In verse 14, it's talking about two things. The believers were courageous and they were infectious. Paul said, every time I sneeze, somebody catches a gospel cold. So I'm, so here's Paul in prison, just sneezing all over these guards and the prisoners and they're catching a gospel cold. So you know what my prayer for you is and for me? I want to pray that as I move into this new year, I'll be more ferocious, I'll be more courageous, I'll be more fearless than I've ever been in my life before, and I'll just sneeze on a lot of people, and I hope my sneeze is loud and wet. You've got to get near people for it to be loud and wet. And make a difference by infecting somebody with the gospel. And then Paul said, as I live it out, I'm contagious. And I want that to describe me, and I want it to describe you. Courageous, infectious, and contagious. Do those three words describe you? And I'm going to help you with that tonight at 630. Amen? Thank you. All right. All right, I've said enough. Did you Now, how many of you feel like I got this? Now listen, now listen. 
you're going to be held accountable for what you've heard this morning. All right? Now, order one of these books. Pick up some of these booklets on your way out this morning. And by God's grace, this is going to be the greatest year of our life. All right, let's bow in prayer. As we close in prayer, uh, I feel led to do this. For 20 years, I went to church. I had church and I had religion, but I didn't have Jesus. And so many times, so I believed it all intellectually, but I never had a conscious, willful choice to ask Jesus Christ to forgive me, be my Savior. Have you done that? When did you do that? And if you've never done that, wouldn't the first Sunday of a new year be a great Sunday for you to pray that prayer if you never have before? So let's bow in prayer. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to lead you in a short prayer. And if you've never prayed a prayer like this before, would you be willing to pray this prayer right now in your heart? Not out loud, I'm not gonna embarrass you, but will you pray this prayer? And start your year like this. All right, pray with me right now if you've never done this. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus Christ to die for me and to pay my sin debt. And right now, by faith, I am trusting him as my Savior. Thank you for forgiving me and giving me eternal life. Amen. Now look up, we're going to have our last song. How many of you are going to pray for a divine eye transplant? Okay, this is our year. Now, can I be brave enough to ask you this? Is there anybody, that lights in my eye right there. Is there anybody here this morning that prayed right now, you prayed with me and asked Christ to forgive you and to be your Savior? Anybody here do that this morning? You're brave enough to say, I did that. Anybody? Anybody do that? I can't see out there. I pray that somebody did. All right? And how many of you are going to say, enough excuses, Lord. This is my year to go mad and make a difference in my world like I never have before because that's why God left you here. All right, God bless you. Have an awesome day. We'll see you at 6.30, won't we? Won't we? Amen. All right, thanks for having me. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Jerry. The elements for the Lord's table.